First, it's a good idea to plot the EZ field at the observation point to make sure it looks as expected and we don't see any reflections. Here's a plot of the EZ field at the observation point. We can see that there is a time delay from the start of the simulation to when the wave reaches the observation point. Then there are some transient fields that are excited by the transmitter being turned on and they propagate through the observation point. And then we can see that we reach a sinusoidal steady state. They, there don't appear to be any noticeable reflections from the edge of the grid, which we might see in the late time of this simulation. And this is what I got for the relative error. We can see that this relative error is not as good as what we saw in one dimension. We get down to minus 2.5, that's on a log scale. The 10 cell thick PML we developed should usually work really well in a two-dimensional grid, the same as the PML in our one-dimensional grid, more or less. However, it turns out that it's really challenging to properly absorb waveguide modes. So the reason our PML doesn't work super well is because we're modeling a waveguide. What can we do about this? Well, we can tweak the PML parameters Maybe we can optimize the grading of the PML and get a better performance for our specific modeling scenario, like M or Sigma Max, for example. There are also more advanced PML options that we can implement. For example, a more advanced PML is the complex frequency shift, CFS PML. It's also known as CPML. We actually used some of the methodology of CPML when we developed RPML. But a true CPML includes two more knobs that we can turn. That is, when we were developing our two-dimensional PML, we set this S, this tensor coefficient, EZX in the PML region, we set it equal to 1 plus sigma EZX in the PML, that's an X, over J omega epsilon. A more advanced and better performing PML for complex scenarios uses instead S PML for easy X. So it would equal kappa plus, and we'd have still have sigma all over alpha X plus J omega epsilon. So this S tensor coefficient gives us the ability to set two more parameters within the PML, alpha and kappa. So what kappa does is it amplifies the attenuation of the wave in the PML, and alpha here shifts the pole in the complex plane away from the origin. So since uh, as the frequency goes to zero, this sigma over j omega epsilon will get closer to one over zero. And so by adding an alpha, we no longer trend towards a division by zero. But in our case, in this class, we aren't going to go to the trouble of implementing the more advanced PML. Instead, we can implement kind of a brute force solution, which is useful when we have limited time. For our brute force solution, we will just thicken the PML. Try running your PML test again, and try setting PML equal to 100. For your small grid, make sure you change IMAX. So IMAX is going to have to change a little bit because we have a thicker PML before we assumed a 10 cell PML. Keep your observation point at i equal 140, and that'll help you to figure out what IMAX needs to be equal to.